Hello, I'm Super Orange Cat here today, covering Made in Abyss Season 2, Episode 4, which aired last night in Toonami. I'm going to go over some of the things I liked about this episode, some of the things I didn't like about this episode, and then tie it up with a big old fat old Super Orange Cat bow at the end. Now, some of the things I did like, this episode was segmented in three ways, with one plotline following each of the main trio of Reg, Rico, and Nanachi. Now, I'm going to go over plotline to plotline, and then say things I liked and things I didn't like. Let's start with, actually, the plotline that really, I think, concluded the first, that was Reg's plotline. So, at the end of the last episode, you see Reg see Faputa, and in this episode, she kidnaps him, takes him to her lair, and then fun, interesting things start to happen. And, I'll have to say, Faputa is a close second, my favorite new character introduced this season, I think if you're looking at this picture right now I'm showing you, you can guess who number one is, but more on her in a second. So, Faputa is crazy as hell. Faputa reminds me of what would happen if Billie Eilish's character from the Bad Guy music video was, like, real. That's what Faputa reminds me of. Especially with the whole licking up Reg's belly button blood. Like, she's crazy. And she's, like, psychotic, and of course, the last thing you want to do if someone is psychotic is to have that character fall in love with you. And it appears Reg is stuck with a love-struck Faputa. And it's implied Faputa knew who Reg was, as they knew each other in the past, but again, Reg, with all the electric shocks, doesn't really remember stuff anymore. So you have Faputa trying to trigger his memory, and trying to figure out, like, oh, I have to, you have to prove your Reg, and she does it by, of course, the belly button stuff. And, unsurprisingly, going after his junk. And, again, it's funny the interaction between these two characters. It's fun to see just how, like, hilariously messed up Faputa is psychologically. Especially since we know that she was the native girl we see with the other travelers at the start of the season. I'll go more into those travelers because one of those travelers makes an appearance at the very end of this episode. And a very interesting reveal. And, yeah. I ultimately thought that was a good plotline. I didn't see any real weaknesses with that plotline, because you have Reg walking out and then sees a makeshift graveyard where it's implied it's probably the rest of the Traveler's sons, two of them. One being Faputa and the other one being, not Faputa who was the native girl, and the other one being Velcro or Velcro, whatever the hell her name is. I don't remember it that well. And more on her in a second. So I thought that was a good plotline. That was a nice plotline. The other one, the one that concluded second, that one being Rico's plotline. You have Rico for, like, the third time already. Most notably, most really reminiscent of Dawn of the Deep Soul. If you watched it, you would kind of have an implication they're referencing it with Rico trying to find the two boys after she gets off the toilet, which, of course, unsurprisingly has tentacles. And she goes out, and she runs into trouble of her own where she's trying to find them. And then you have some suspicious-looking hollows following her. And then she gets led into a dark alley where they get a little uh, handsy with her. They steal and they attack Ma Squeeze Manya. And then out of nowhere, number one character, Maiden Abyss Season 2. And at this rate, maybe number one Maiden Abyss character, period. Ma shows in, runs him over like she's a freaking fullback. And then she takes Manya. She saves Rico, gets him out of there when the evening comes, and a, the evening thing, the black goo thing, comes out and attacks everyone else in the tunnel. And I thought that was just a great moment for Ma. Great redemption moment after hurting Manya and squeezing out his butt guts last episode. And that's just a really, uh, when you get into... Only, that, that goes into maybe my biggest... One of my two big complaints about this episode with, okay... It's implied. I know what they're trying to set up when Rico said, well, I don't recognize these hollows, like, a little, like, a few minutes earlier, that these are hollows that were not there, seeing Ma getting ripped to shreds for hurting Mania the previous episode. With that being said, if the hollows are there, it seems like it's a pretty well-known thing by all the hollows in that village what the evening is. And... What would be the logic of even directly, maliciously going in and trying to steal something at that point? I guess their, the theory is they didn't know Mania was, like, exceptionally important to Rico and thought, oh, this is just, like, a little stuffed animal or a little pet she has. If we, if we heard it, it's not going to matter. If we steal it, it's not going to matter. 
But, like, again, at the same time, they knew they were going to get some type of universal punishment from this because the evening seems to be, like, a thing that everyone there knows about. So why would there be hollows that, like, just don't know what any of that just is, I guess? But it seems like it's like it's like going up to a Christian preacher talking about like Jesus and God and stuff, and then be, them being absolutely surprised when you mention that God is omnipotent, even though that's one of the most well-known things about the Abrahamic God is that it's supposed to be omnipotent. It just makes no sense that they wouldn't know that, and it makes no sense that they would even try anything considering, like it's like Sharia law, but if they catch you one hundred percent of the time. With that 100% of the time should be the incentive to never try any of this. I digress. I'm getting into some weird philosophical Foucault pendulum level stuff here. It just kind of made less sense. And all this made not as much sense as how, how Nanachi's plotline ends here. Nanachi's plotline, he's following Majikaju, talking to him. Majikaju mentions, oh yeah, Bondru brought Midi here at some point. And it's like, how the hell do you know this? And how did Bondrew bring Mitty here when I took Mitty with me last season? And we know Mitty doesn't exist anymore because Reg incinerated her. And that was why Nanachi followed them in the first place because he wasn't burdened by Mitty anymore. So, and then it's like, oh, he's alive. And he's like, let me see her. And Majikaj is like, fine. So they take them, they see, and he clearly sees her, and it's left up in the air because this is how the episode ends, whether this is, like, some mental illusion or some philosophical point, or if Mitty is still a hollow and right in front of him right now. And then you get a line at the end from the last living traveler in Velcro, Velcro, I don't even know what the hell her name is, I don't really care that much, I dislike her. And I know a lot of people really, really, really like her as a character. Give you credit. I I do not dislike her as much as more of like the other two characters we know from the travels. Like the older guy and like the white hair boy, I hate more than her. But take that as solace, I guess. And she reveals like, oh, when someone finds their treasure, their journey comes to an end which seems to imply that this is going to be the end of the road of Nanachi, where it's like the whole narrative started because Midi was clearly no more. And not like, an oh, Midi is missing. More than like, Midi is gone. Midi is dead. And that's something that Nanachi was thankful for Reg for doing. And then he followed him along because he really had no thing else to do. He was probably going to off himself if they just didn't take him. So it's like, now... now now, why is seeing Mitty an amazing thing to you when seeing Mitty in this condition caused you so much pain and torment, and you were thankful for Reg for ending this for you? I don't get that. And maybe next episode explains this better, and it's probably something like, oh, this is an illusion. But if Nanachi seriously decides, oh, I'm, I'm happy now, I'm going to live in this village forever with what's like the astral projection of Mitty, then does, I guess, Ma who's now falling around Rika, does that become the third character? I wouldn't be against that, honestly, if that's a thing, but, like, I mean, I don't get it. Maybe Faputa becomes the third character, which would be hysterical. But, I digress, you know. Just imagine, like, Reg is doing his whole sleep trap thing where he, like, uses his, like, swings his arms around like it's a spider net, spider web or something. And we're to know Faputa can sneak through that no problem. Watch, like, Rika wake up middle of the night, she says Faputa just kind of like on top of Reg, and then Faputa just stares at Rika and then whispers at her, or something. That would be hysterical, you know? And I guess there's another controversy episode. If you watched it, you know very well it's, this episode gets kind of fancy with tentacles. One, there's tentacles in the toilet, and two, where the tentacles go on Rika when they're like tapping her, when they're attacking Mitty. I could see people finding that controversial, because I see a lot of people when Alicization had their two uh, uh, forceful kithing scenes in Alicization, people be like, oh, this was terrible, it should be removed from the air! I mean, people say that all the time with Sword Online, because that's, that's a theme of Sword on the Line, but I could see people doing that with this show, 
the same time, that's not the plot of the show. That's just stuff that's, that's not like, people are like, oh, it's like when people point at something like Sailor Moon and be like, look at their outfits. It's fan service without forgetting that Sailor Moon actually has a very, very competent plot and very good theming and very good characters and stuff. That's what Made in Abyss is in a way. Made in Abyss is a show that has been great the entire time. There hasn't been a period where it slowed down in quality. Like, I'm going to ultimately say this is still like a 7.5, 8 out of 10 episode. This was a solid episode. But people are going to be like, oh, and they'll point at the little controversies and overlook the fact that the show is just very well written. Or the manga, I guess, because it's all based on the manga, is very well written, very thought out with deep, thoughtful characters. And at this point, I could not care less, you know? I am super orange. Again, 8 out of 10 episode. Very solid, and it's implied in the future we're going to get what happens to Nanachi next episode. I don't think Tanami actually cut a promo for the next episode like they did two weeks ago for this one. It would be interesting to see if one shows up magically midweek. But again, 8 out of 10 episode, it was pretty solid. I'm excited for next week. We get the solving the Nanachi problem. You have Rico and Ma now trying to find the two boys, and you have maybe more... We get more clues about what happened to the travelers who I mostly dislike. I'm Super Orange Cat, and that is all.